everyone. In this video, we are talking about radicals. So the square root of 5 is 25 because 5 squared equals 25. OK, what does this have to do with radicals? Let's see. Well, the square of negative 5 is 25 because negative 5 squared is also 25. Quick note, if you have parentheses, you're squaring, you're taking negative 5 times itself so the negative times a negative turns positive. If there was no parentheses, this would have actually equaled negative 25. So we should be able to reverse this process to find a number that multiplies to give 25, and that's where radicals come in. How do we go backwards? If I start with 25 and I want to know what number squared gives me 25, what symbol do I use for that? Well, it's this square root symbol. So you would read this as square root of a, and it translates to this sentence. So what number multiplies times itself to give you the number a? So in math, we have symbols, a bunch of symbols, and we have to actually translate this into what it's actually asking or telling us. So when you see this square root symbol with a number inside, this is actually what you want to ask yourself. What number multiplies times itself to give me what's inside this square root? 5 is the square root of 25 because 5 squared equals 25. Negative 5 is also a square root of 25 because of the same idea. Now the radical symbol always represents the positive or principal root. So by definition, this symbol right here represents only the positive answer. So if I'm starting with 25 and trying to find what number squared gets me 25, this symbol is asking for the positive answer. So if you want to find the negative one, the negative square root, you have to put a negative in front of the radical symbol. So square root of 25, the translation, remember this question, this is saying what number squared equals 25? That answer is 5. We don't say 5 or negative 5. We'd have to actually put a negative sign in front if we wanted that to be the case. Square root a, the radical symbol is just this outside part. What's inside is called the radicand. And then the whole thing is called a radical. So it's just some vocabulary for you. Inside a radical symbol is called the radicand. So we'll mention that a few times. You'll hear me say it. Also a note here, there is no number that multiplies times itself to give you a negative number. So this answer here to what is the square root, it's going to be positive, first of all, unless you put a minus sign in the front. But also, the radicand has to be 0 or more. It has to be greater than or equal to 0. Because no number squared, when you take a number times itself, is ever going to be negative. The square root of a number must always be positive. So if we have square root of x squared, even though x squared has to be positive, because any time you square a value, it's going to turn positive or be positive, it's possible that the number x was actually negative to start with. So we can't just say that the square root, the radical sign, cancels or undoes the squaring we're going to have to put absolute value bars here. So we put absolute value bars because, remember, the radical symbol is actually asking the question, and it wants a positive answer. It represents the positive square root. Now, the square root here, technically, you can think of it like undoing the square because of the idea of what this symbol represents. So here's what I'm saying about thinking that it cancels. And this is not the best um, notation, but I do just want you to see what I'm talking about. If you think of this radical symbol undoing the squaring because of what it's asking, it's asking you what quantity squared gives you the inside? What, what squared gives you x squared? Well, the answer is x. But we just have to make sure that it's positive, so we put absolute value bars. What I was just mentioning, we just can't go right into saying that they cancel because we do have to consider the absolute value of the answer. So for example, let's make this make sense with some numbers. Square root of 
negative 6 squared, but notice the negative 6 is in parentheses. So if you square that, you actually get 36. And this is asking you a question. This is asking what number squared gives you 36? What positive number? The answer is 6. Okay, so that's how you would answer that square root question. And if the original was negative 6, which it was, it's the absolute value of negative 6. So negative 6 would not be our answer, even though we squared negative 6 to get 36. The answer is always positive for the square roots. So for this one, where we don't actually know the number that x equals, we can still figure this out. So you want to figure out, well, what squared gives me this radicand? Well, it would be x to the sixth squared. Because of our rules of exponents, you multiply 6 times 2, and that's where we could get 12. So x to the sixth squared, and then if you're asking square root of that, your square root, your radical, is undoing the squaring. And so you get x to the sixth. But because we don't know what x is, we do have to put our absolute value bars to maintain that it's positive. However, something with an even exponent in this particular example, we don't actually need the absolute value bars because if you think about it, if you had a positive number and you multiplied that number six times, well, yeah, it's going to be a positive answer. But if you had a negative number and you multiplied it six times, it would also be positive. So it's a good practice to put the absolute value bars on there, but in this particular case, when when the exponent is even, you don't have to put those bars. But if you're not sure, just put them. So when the output of a radical expression has an odd power, we need to include absolute value bars since the expression could still be negative. Just like we can reverse the process of raising to the power of 2 by squaring, okay, so squaring is the power of 2, we can reverse the process of raising to any power. So what we're about to do is expand this idea of square roots to bigger roots, so like cube roots and fourth roots and so on. Example, what number multiplies by itself three times to get eight? So that uh, question is all represented right here in this radical. So in math, it's a, a language of symbols, just this symbol right here, this cubed root of 8, translates to this sentence. So what number times itself three times gives you 8? And the answer to that is 2, because 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So cubed root of 8 is 2. And another way to see the idea with the radicals is this radical with a 3 in this little crevice right here, that's called an index. That would, you can think of that as canceling or undoing the third power. So you can think of this radical as undoing this third power, and you're left with two. The index tells us how many of the same factor we are looking for. So for example, if this was a four, we'd be asking about a number multiplying four times, and so on. So some common perfect squares, perfect cubes, and perfect fourths. So these are numbers that you don't have to necessarily memorize, but it's good to recognize them as they come up. So you don't have to try to think about it every single time. If you know these ones, and some of them probably look familiar, if you know these, then you can quickly go backwards and find their square roots. So for example, if we just pick like 49, square root of 49 would be 7, because 7 squared is 49. So it's good to know at least these first 12 perfect squares. So the left side is what we call the perfect squares, and that's because they equal something squared. Okay, let's extend our list a little bit more. 13 squared is 169. We have 14 squared, 15 squared, and then we'll just start skipping some numbers. 20 squared is 400, 25 squared is 625, 30 squared is 900. So let's move to cubes. 1 times 1 times 1 is just 1. So what's 2 times 2 times 2? 8. And 3 times 3 times 3? 27. So these are more numbers to recognize when they show up. 
So these are all perfect cubes. So if you see these numbers in red, you can go backwards and find their cubed root fairly quickly if you recognize them. Okay, and then let's do some fourths, perfect fourths. One to the fourth power is just one times one times one times one. Two to the fourth is two times two times two times two, which is 16. What's three to the fourth? 81, okay? Four to the fourth is 256. Five to the fourth is 625. 10 to the fourth is just 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, so we get 10,000. And then some perfect fifths. What you might notice, one of them uh, that I want to point out is 64. 64 is a perfect square because it's 8 squared, but it's also a perfect cube. It's 4 cubed. Another number to point out is 81. 81 is a perfect square because it's 9 squared, but it's also a perfect fourth. It is 3 to the 4. So some of these numbers repeat on different lists. So just pay attention to the index when you're working with the radical to figure out which one you want. If the question is, what is the square root of 64, you would say 8. But if the question is, what is the cubed root of 64, you would say 4. So the nth root of a is written as nth root of a. <laughs> so the index is n. And what it means is the following. So if b to the n equals a, it implies that the nth root of a is the number b. So let me make this make a little bit of sense to you. If you have some number and you raise it to a certain power and you get an answer, if you want to go backwards, it specifically you undoing that power, that exponent, that's what's happening with this nth root of a. So it takes you back to what number was raised to that power. So example, fourth root of 81. This translates into the question, what number times itself four times equals 81? Well, it's three. And that's because three to the fourth is 81. If x is a real number and n is one or more, so n is the index here, it's the exponent on the number that we were looking for. So as long as it's one or more, then the following is true. If n is odd, the nth root of x to the n is x. Okay, so this is the whole idea where the radical undoes the exponent if the index matches the exponent. Okay, so if the index here matches the power. For example, if you take a square root of something squared, you would get the original base, x, like this. If you take a cubed root of something cubed, same idea. So when the index and the power match. However, we talked about this already, if the index was even, and this exponent is even, you have to put absolute value bars. Because anytime you raise any number to an even power, it becomes positive, and that's regardless of if it was negative or positive to begin with. So if the index is odd, like our example was actually an even one, if the index was odd, there's only one real, real root, but if it's even, like our example was the case where it's even, we have to consider the absolute value bars. So for example, the fifth root of negative 32 times x to the 15th. Okay, let's break this down. We have two things going on, and I recommend breaking it down into the different types of things in your base. So there was a real number part that's part of the base, and there's also an x, a variable. So what number to the fifth power is negative 32? That number is negative 2. What number to the fifth, or what variable x to the fifth power is 15, x to the 15? Well, it's x cubed. Okay, and let's just come back to this before we go forward. Negative 2 times itself 5 times is in fact negative 32. And then x to the third raised to the fifth power, when you multiply, you do in fact get x to the 15th power. Now, notice what's happening. You have a fifth root 
of quantities to the fifth power. So the fifth root is going to undo the fifth power. And then the answer is just the negative 2 times x cubed. Because the index and the powers were both odd, you don't have to put absolute value bars. We can take odd roots of negative numbers since a negative times itself an odd number of times becomes negative. So what does this really mean? It means, this is why we're more interested in it, we are not able to take even roots of negative numbers. And that's because nothing um, to an even power will ever become negative. Here's an example. Fourth root of negative 16. What, to, what number to the fourth power equals negative 16 is what this is asking. Well, what times itself, four times, gives you negative 16? Hmm, well, 2 to the fourth is 16, not negative 16, okay? Hmm, negative 2 to the fourth is also 16, not negative 16. So not a real number. There is no real number that when you raise it to the fourth power will ever be negative. And so you just want to be on the lookout for this. Anytime your index is even, okay, so if you have an even index, you're taking an even root, square root, fourth root, sixth root, and so on. The radicand cannot be negative because it's not a real number. And just so you're aware, in the future, we will define square roots of negatives as imaginary numbers.